I wanted to talk to you about the one thing that'll make a difference in everything, and that's your prayer life. The title of the message is Praying Like Jesus. Praying Like Jesus. When you and I pray, powerful things happen. When you and I pray, we receive from God. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. James talking about prayer in James chapter 4 and verse 2 says, you have not because you ask not. How many times do people not receive from God? Not because he wouldn't, but because they didn't ask in prayer. Prayer is not only powerful in your life, but in a very real sense, prayer is prophetic in every person's life. Show me the transcript of your prayer and I will tell you the trajectory of your life. Show me what you're asking God to do. If you're asking, I'll tell you what he'll do. That's why prayer is so important. If you and I wanna live a power-filled life, if you wanna see God work in your life, if you wanna see the miraculous happen, if you wanna see the hand of God on your life, if you wanna see the hand of the Lord on the lives of your family members, if you wanna see God go before you, then all of it begins with prayer. So in the next few moments, what I wanna do is I wanna talk to you about six principles. I wanna give you six principles for a powerful life or a power-filled life. So we're gonna jump right into this. I'm gonna give you the first one right now. All of these are from Luke chapter 11, verses one through 13. The goal is not so much to exposit every single verse, part of it is the Lord's Prayer, but to simply extrapolate from this passage six principles that will encourage you and I in our prayer life, help us to grow and help us hopefully to pray. Number one, powerful prayer is the source of a power-filled life. Powerful prayer. If you want a power-filled life, then be a person who prays powerfully. And we see that in the life of Jesus. Look at it in Luke chapter 11, verse one. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. It's a very, very interesting statement that the disciples make. Because honestly, think of what they've seen. They've seen him open the eyes of the blind. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him take and multiply the the fishes and the loaves of bread to feed uh, thousands of people. They've seen him do all kinds of things. They've seen him draw large crowds. They've seen his wisdom. And now what are they asking? You'd think they'd be asking, Lord, teach us how to draw large crowds. Teach us how to be able to teach the word like you do. Teach us how to do different miracles. Teach us how to have authority over demons. But no, they say, teach us to pray. The thing they understood about him as they walked with him, as they watched him, is it became obvious to to them that the secret to everything else he did was his prayer life. When they were with him, he was praying all the time, always getting away, always withdrawing that he might spend time in prayer with the Father. In fact, you see it in Luke chapter three at his baptism. It says, now when all the people were baptized, And when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, so at his baptism, he's praying. As he's praying, it says, the heaven was open. You want to see an open heaven in your life. You want to see God rain down blessing. Get baptized, give yourself to prayer, and watch the heavens open over your life. Jesus gave himself to prayer. Before big decisions, Luke chapter 6, before he selects the disciples, what does he do? He prays. Sometimes you and I face decisions. We don't know the right thing to do. We're not sure. It's not clear. It's not obvious. We need to pray. Some of you have come into this new year, and you know you're going to be making some big decisions, which job to take, which school to go to, which house to buy, which, which person to marry. You need to pray. 
Look at this. Now, when all the people, Luke chapter 6, in those days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. He prayed. He sought God. Spent an all-night time in prayer. As the crowds began to follow him and they got larger and larger, what did he do? He prayed. Luke chapter 5 says, but he would withdraw to desolate places and he would pray, seeking the Lord. It says this in Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. He's getting ready to reveal his identity. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? If you want people to see Jesus' identity, pray. Pray for them. Pray that Christ might be exposed to them. If you want people to see Christ in you, pray. Look at it in Luke chapter 9. It says this in verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. The glory on the inside became evident on the outside. When did that happen? It happened as he prayed. If you want the glory of God that's in you to shine on the outside, then give yourself to prayer. Prayer is the key to a power-filled life. Jesus prayed all the time. That's why Mark says in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus gave himself to prayer. And I'm just simply saying, as we start this year, if you give yourself, if you cultivate that habit, if you get up a little bit early, if you say, I'm going to seek the Lord, you will see him do amazing things in your life. It's the second principle I want you to notice. Powerful prayer is based on a relationship with God as our Father. Look at it in Luke chapter 11 and verse 2. And he, that's Jesus, said to them, When you pray, say, Father. In other words, when you and I pray, some people say, you know what, I I just like to, you know, I I talk to Jesus. That's how I talk to. And other people are like, you know, I I say spirit, and and, and that's, I, I go, I pray to the spirit. You say, is that wrong? It's not wrong. I'm just simply saying that if you look at what the Bible teaches, relative certainly toward petitioning. It's not wrong to enjoy fellowship with Jesus or the fellowship of the Spirit, but I would suggest to you that Jesus' encouragement and the work of the Spirit is that you and I would pray to the Father. I mean, in Matthew chapter six, we read this. Pray then like this, our Father. That's the way Jesus taught us to pray. In John's gospel, we read this. This is at the Last Supper, so he's given the disciples some last-minute instructions, if you will. In that day, you'll ask nothing of me. So he's saying, you're not going to be asking me to do things. What day? When he's gone. We're in that day now. We're not asking him to do things. Truly, I say, whatever you ask of the Father in my name. In other words, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I come because I know this is what Jesus would want. We pray to the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look, he says, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. What a great promise from Scripture that if we ask, we will receive. You look in Romans chapter 8, the the work of the Holy Spirit. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. When the Spirit of God is working in your life, he's going to cause you to pray to the Father. You see it again in Galatians chapter 4. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That, That the Spirit of God causes us to see ourselves as children of God. And this is really critical. In this teaching on prayer, in Luke chapter 11, in in verse 
verse 2, and in verse 13, it's, the passage is bookended, if you will, with Father. Look at it in verse 13. If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What Jesus is telling us about prayer, what he has to say about prayer is it begins with talking to the Father and it ends with receiving from the Father. Do you catch that? And it's really critical how we view that. It's important that you and I see God as our Father because that is the paradigm. That is the basis of how prayer is to work in the life of the believer. Because here's what happens. If you don't see God as Father, you'll see him as something else, and it will cause you to have a warped prayer life. You say, what do you mean? Well, if you don't see him as Father, well, a lot of people, a lot of people don't see God as Father, they see him as employer. You say, what do you mean? Well, they go and they say, God, I need you to do this. And then if it doesn't happen, they're like, God, I worked for you. I, I did this. I, I went to church. I was in a life group. I went through grow track. I, I gave money. I was nice to this person. God, I did all these things. Now you owe me. I worked for you. You're my employer. You owe me. Or people will view God as a computer. You say, what do you mean? Well, when you input something in the computer, once it's there, it's there, right? You don't have to keep inputting it. Some people view prayer, they they view prayer this way and they view God as like a computer. It's like, well, I told him once because they don't see him as a father and they don't see themselves as his child. What happens is they, they don't understand the relational aspect of prayer. And Jesus is going to tell us a parable that illustrates that. But if you don't understand that, you'll say, well, I told him and I haven't received. I don't know. Prayer doesn't work. But God is our father. That's the basis of powerful prayer and a power-filled life. Or if, if you don't see him as your father, what happens, a lot of people see him as a genie. You know, rub the lamp prayers where you rub the lamp and you get the three wishes. Genie comes out and says, what is your wish? Or your wish is my command. People say, you know, I I don't get it. I asked and it didn't happen. How come? Prayer doesn't work. Because see, they see God as a genie, not as their father. You see, when you see God as your father and you see yourself as a child, here's one thing I know about children. Children understand that big people do a lot of things they don't understand. They just accept it. They don't, they don't, they don't, they're not suspicious about it. They're not worked up about it. They're just saying, you know what? Sometimes big people don't do what I ask them to do. And it's a good thing, right? When you say God is your father, it changes how you respond in prayer. A lot of people don't have a very good prayer life. And the reason why is because God's their employer or God is a genie or God is a computer and it has discouraged them from seeking him. They've not understood he's a father and they're a son or a daughter. Let me give you a third principle. Powerful prayer is the key to seeing God's will done. Look at it, Luke chapter 11, verse two. And he, that's Jesus, said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. There's a respect, there's a reverence for God, there's there's a sense of his great awesomeness, and at the same time, the intimacy of relationship with him. It, It is a beautiful paradox. Then it's your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Matthew puts it this way, uh, and this is Jesus giving the Lord's Prayer in another setting. So it's something he taught often. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Powerful prayer doesn't say 
thy kingdom come, my will be done. Powerful prayer says, God, what I want is I want your will. I want what's, what you desire. I want the way it is in heaven to be happening on earth. I want my life to line up with heavenly desire, with heavenly design, with heavenly destiny. I want my life to walk according to your footsteps. Not my will, but your will. That's what I want. Let it be done in my life here on earth as it is in heaven. When you start praying that way, when you start, when you start either A, understanding the will of God and you pray it into existence, or when you don't know God's will, you're simply desiring his will and you're praying that it be revealed to you, that it be demonstrated in your life, that will give you a power-filled life. Number four, powerful prayer is concerned about others as well as ourselves. Something that throws a lot of people is they spend all their time praying about themselves and for themselves. Not understanding the prayer, while certainly God is, is willing to meet our needs. As Jesus teaches on prayer, watch what happens here. Luke chapter 11 and verse 3. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves the first person singular is not present in Jesus prayer isn't that interesting it's not about me myself and I it's about we and us and our it recognizes the community Jesus said this, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Take care of praying for other people and watch God take care of, of the things that matter in your life. That's the way prayer works. Give us our, forgive us our sins. We ourselves lead us. And prayer recognizes the, the community of believers. It recognizes the need to pray for one another. It, it, in fact, James warns us against prayers that are self-centered. Look at it in James chapter 4. You do not have what you want because you do not ask God for it. So if you don't pray, it's not going to happen. Let me say that again. If you don't pray, it's not going to happen. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. You do not have what you want because you do not ask God for it. And when you ask, you do not receive it. Why? Because your motives are bad. You ask for things to use for your own pleasures. And listen, it's very, very important. And in our Western Christianity, we have, a, we have such a, a focus on the individual that that's seeped into our spiritual understanding. And it cut the heart out of biblical prayer. Biblical prayer recognizes the community, the needs of the community. This is why the prayer meeting is so absolutely important. Because when we're coming together, are your needs going to be met? Sure. Have my needs been met at prayer? Absolutely. But it's about praying for more than myself. It's about praying for more than ourselves. It's recognizing the community. It's recognizing the needs around us. It's recognizing what God is doing in the greater church. And when the church prays, God will do powerful things in the church, which will be a blessing to everybody who's a part of the church. Listen, the stronger the church is, the stronger your family will be. The stronger the church is, the more spiritually powerful, the more it'll affect not only your home, not only your marriage, not only your children's schools, but it'll affect the workplace, it'll affect the community, it'll affect the state. Prayer has that kind of power on a church. 
That's why I'm just telling you, the more we pray, the more we seek God, the more we'll see God do in the church. I'm looking forward for the day when this auditorium, the West Auditorium, the North Auditorium, the Joplin Auditorium on Wednesday night is filled, full to overflowing, not because there was some crisis, but because God's people understood the power of calling on God and the blessing it would bring into their life. I mean, listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. And I'm gonna give you a few quotes because Spurgeon, one of the great preachers in the history of Christianity in the 1800s began preaching when he was 19 years old. By age 25, the church had grown. They had to build a new building to seat 6,000. And the day before mega churches, an auditorium that seated 6,000 people would line up outside to hear him preach. What was the secret to Spurgeon's church, the prayer meeting. Listen to what he says. The condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a graceometer. And from it, we may judge of the amount of divine working among a people. In other words, as you and I pray, God works in an extra measure. In the last 19 years, since we started the prayer meeting, I have seen it work with scientific precision. When the church prays well, the church is powerful. When the church becomes lethargic in prayer, then you see the church become lethargic in ministry. You look at last fall. We started in the summer, that fasting and prayer, and people were at the prayer meeting so much so we opened the curtain. You look back on the services in the fall, what we saw God do. It was amazing. As the prayer meeting goes, so goes the church. Listen to this. If God be near a church, it must pray. And if he be not there, one of the first tokens of his absence will be a slothfulness in prayer. Spurgeon went on to say this. Believe me, if a church does not pray, it is dead. It may have activity, it may have meetings, it may be doing different things, but if it wants to have spiritual power, it has to pray. Listen, straight up, what you're sitting in, what you're seeing speaks to the truth of this. 1998, we started the prayer meeting, and I'm gonna tell you what, if, if, if I brought up charts and graphs, you would see from the day the church started to pray, exponentially, exponentially, More salvations, more baptisms, more influence, more power. The church is, how do you explain a church like this in a little town like Springfield with multi-site? Look around you. I mean, the place is full of people. As soon as James River began to pray, powerful things happened. This building is a miracle from the throne of grace. The land up on the, on the east where we will have, Lord willing, a northy or an east campus, that is, a, that is a gift from the Lord. The north campus is a gift from the Lord. The west campus, stories abound of the church praying and God answering. When we pray, supernaturally powerful things happen that wouldn't happen any other way. One last quote, it is not a matter of time so much as a matter of heart. If you have the heart to pray, you will find the time to pray. People say, I'm so busy. It's it's not a matter of time, it's a matter of heart. I understand some people have to work. I'm not shaming you if you have a job. I'm just simply saying that when you invest yourself in spending time by yourself, certainly you can pray at your home, but that's not the same as praying with the church. It's not either or, it's both and. Powerful prayer recognizes the key or recognizes others that it's not just about ourselves. Number five, powerful prayer aggressively seeks a response from God. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, you can underline aggressively. It aggressively seeks a response from God. So here's Jesus. He's given him the Lord's Prayer, a template, if you will, an example of prayer. And now what Jesus does is he wants us to get into the spirit of prayer. Here's how you pray. 
And now he says, here's what you would say, how you might think about it, but here is the attitude, if you will, of prayer. And he tells a story. Verse five, and he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Now, you and I in our Western mindset, we're like, well, tell the dude, breakfast is served in the morning, go to bed. <laughs> Why is somebody getting somebody else up in the middle of the night? Again, in our Western mindset, we don't get this. His, his audience would have immediately recognized the gravity of this situation. Because in the Oriental mindset, hospitality is paramount. The way you treat people who come to you is a reflection on you. You honor them for the sake of your own honor and the honor of your community. One translation starts this by saying, imagine if you will, and Jesus' hearers would have heard this and said, that is shocking, that would never happen. They could not imagine that somebody would have a visitor in the middle of the night, need food, go to a neighbor and say, hey, can I get some food? And that neighbor say, nope, sorry, can't do it. Because that would not only dishonor the friend who is asking, it would dishonor the person who turned down the request and it would result in the dishonor of the village for generations. So what you have is you have a, a guy who's coming in from out of town. He shows up at a friend's house and he says, surprise, I'm here. The friend's like, he didn't know he was coming. If he didn't know, he'd have had something ready. And he's like, man, I don't have anything because like they don't have Walmart, 24-hour Walmarts. They don't have, you know, their, their bread does, isn't chock full of five pounds of preservatives so it doesn't go stale. I mean, bread, bread goes stale very fast in that day. So he realizes he doesn't have any bread, but he remembers that earlier in the day, the neighbor, he could smell the smell of fresh baked bread. He knows they have bread. So he goes to his friend and he says, give me three loaves. Why three loaves? Because again, it's not a matter of just meeting the need. It's a matter of meeting the need with generosity that speaks not only of your honor for your guest, but the honor of your own household and your own willingness to provide generously. This is the story Jesus is setting up, verse seven. And he will answer from within. So now the friend comes and says, hey, give me some of that. And the guy inside the house, he says, don't bother me. Jesus says, can you imagine that? And the people are like, that's crazy, that would never happen. But the guy says, don't bother me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. What are we talking about there? We're talking about a one room house. So you have everything all together. You've got the, the man, his wife, his kids, and they're all together. And now this guy is knocking on the window and he's, or the door, and he's saying, hey, you in there? And the guy wakes up, he's like, who is it? It's me, your friend, your neighbor. I've, I've got guests from out of town. I know, you, I know your wife made bread today. Can, can I get three loaves? Because I gotta have something. And the guy says, shh, you're gonna wake up the kids. If you've ever had kids who are light sleepers, you know the seriousness of this moment. Especially if your kids are close together in age. I mean, our kids are 30 months apart from, you know, David to Savannah. And so, I mean, and all of them were seemingly light sleepers and all of them cried. I mean, they cried through the night. I mean, it was, and not that little soft, sweet cry. Um, I mean, our kids all went for the big band sound. So, I mean, so he's saying, don't wake up the kids because if you do that, my children and I are in bed, I cannot get up and give you anything. Then watch what happens, verse eight. Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs, impudence. This is the key to understanding the attitude of prayer. 
You say, what does that mean? A lot of people have thought impudence means um, his persistence. He keeps doing it, he keeps knocking, he keeps knocking. That's, that's not really it. Impudence, the word, it's a Greek word, anaidion, and it, it's only used one time in the New Testament, so it's a little hard to define, but scholars agree, here's what it means. It doesn't have to do with persistence, it has to do with nerve. Like, I'm a nervy person. Gall, insolence, brazenness, audacity, for the Brits here, cheekiness. <laughs> if you're familiar with, with any Jewish phrases, chutzpah, impolite, nerve, rudeness. I told the, uh, I told the uh, first, Jesus is saying, let me just say this, first of all, Jesus is saying that's how you approach God. It's very interesting. On the one hand, hallowed be thy name. On the other hand, audacity. I told the story in the first service, so, and Debbie was here, but, uh, so I, I put that as a disclaimer because some of you will say I threw her under the bus. <laughs> this week, we happened to be in Washington, D.C., and we were there to watch the, the swearing in of, of one of our senators who happens to have family from James River. And so it was a great opportunity to be with them and to be able to pray and to celebrate what God has done in their life. So we're, we're at the swearing in on Thursday. And, and if you've been to the, to the Capitol and seen the gallery up above the, the Senate floor, and so we're, we're seated in there, and you got to get there early. And, and so they, they seat us in this section. And, and you know, it's, it's, there's certainly not, there, there's no Barca loungers in that place. I mean, it's all very tight seating. And so you, like, cramped your knees up to your chin and, and uh, tights. And so we're there at 1030, and it doesn't start till, till noon. So we're sitting in there, and... And there's, there's a usher who's in charge of our section and, and capitalize all caps, charge. Um, this, this was one of those guys, bless his heart, who should never be given one ounce of authority ever, um, <laughs> but has all the authority in that moment. So, you know, so we're sitting in there and we're watching the dude and like, he's going up to the ladies that are in front of us and they're just talking just quietly. And he comes over and says, no talking. And I mean, so it's this kind of thing. I mean, like an hour before the ceremony, like who's it hurting? A guy stands up, and, and, an older gentleman, and um, he's like, sit down. You know, so it's, it's just that kind of thing going on. And you're like, he's got everybody in the section very intimidated. So we go through the, we go through the event. And as we're, as we're there and watching everything, it's over now. And people are gradually starting to leave. And so some people in our section start to get up. He's like, sit down. So, I mean, so everybody's like, sitting down and he's, he's just got everybody intimidated, but we're watching some people are, are leaving. And now, you know, it's 1.30. So like the thing's long over and, and we've been there now three hours. And Debbie <laughs> says to me, I'm leaving. <laughs> and she gets up and she makes her way over to this in charge guy. And I mean, I'm thinking, I, as she's going, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. I mean, we're going to be on CNN. Demonic yoga pastor's wife is arrested. You know, it's... it's <laughs> so she goes up to this guy who's, who's a big guy. And she says, sir, I'm leaving. Gall audacity, <laughs> nerve, cheekiness. And he looks at her and he says, there's a chair right by him, sit down. So she sits down and I'm watching this and I'm thinking, she's on the naughty chair, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and she looks at me and I'm like, like that. And she, no sooner does she do that, then she stands back up and she says, with all of the gall, brazenness, chutzpah, nerve, and rudeness, she says, sir, I am leaving and so are my friends. 
And she points to my three friends. And so he's like, well, okay, like that. So all of a sudden we start walking out, but then everybody else in the gallery, they're going out. And when we get out of there, they're all thanking Debbie. Debbie's in the hallway, has a receiving line. They're all like. <laughs> all that to say, when you go to God, Jesus is saying, that you go with this brazenness, you go with this aggressiveness, you go with this sense of, God, this is what I need you to do. This is what I have to have from you. That God, as you come to him, remember, it's a father with a child. And you've seen a child who, who wants something from their father. I mean, they can ask their dad to do something nobody else would ask. The guy could be the world's cruelest dictator. He could be the leader of the most violent cartel. But if his five-year-old gets up and says, daddy, get me a drink of water in the middle of the night, guess what? He's probably going to do it. If his wife or girlfriend asks, he's going to say, what are your legs broke? Go get it. I mean, nobody's going to be able to ask but a child can go and can ask for what no one else asks and do it in the middle of the night and ask for the simplest or the most complicated thing. A child can do that. And Jesus says, when you go to God, go with that kind of understanding. You're his child and you can ask in the middle of the night and you can ask for something big, you can ask for something little. You can ask and you don't have to flower it up and you don't have to make it all you just go. And if you're a child, you go and you go and you go. Ever had your kids and they're like, they ask, can we do this? You said we could do this. And does that, does that irritate you as a parent? Absolutely not. You're like, you love when, you're, when your child asks you for the things you said you were going to do. That, Daddy, you said we were going to go here. You said we were going to do that. That's right. We we're going to do that. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Things that might annoy anyone else or that if anybody else did to you might annoy you from your child you love. Jesus says, that's how that works. There's another way to look at this word. It can also be translated shamelessness. In, this, in that understanding, it would be this. Jesus is saying, can you imagine a friend needing something and going to the guy and the guy saying, don't bother me. Can you imagine him ultimately saying no, the, the guy who has the bread ultimately saying no? And their answer would have been, that would never happen. Because his family honor and the honor of the village is at stake. You say, which, which interpretation is right? I want to suggest to you both of them. That it's the audacity of the petitioner on the one hand and the honor of the one being petitioned on the other. That God is not going to be dishonored. God is not going to withhold some, from somebody something he can do for them that he knows they need. He's not going to let that happen. So go to him. And when you go, go aggressively. Go believing. Go asking. Go seeking. I want to ask you, when's the last time you so knew something was from God or you so desperately needed it that you said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. Watch this. And I tell you, here's Jesus' moral of the story, if you will, on that parable. Keep on asking. I put it in brackets because in, in the ESV it'll say, so I tell you, ask, and it will be given. In the Greek, it's keep on asking. Keep on asking. Keep on asking. Some of you asked once and quit. And you said... Prayer doesn't work. Why? Because you didn't understand God your Father. You didn't understand that you pursue Him aggressively. And you didn't understand that you ask, you ask, you keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. How long do you keep on asking? You ask until it's given to you. 
This is the spirit of prayer. The old timers called it praying through, where you say, God, I'm gonna get a hold of you and I'm not gonna let go until I receive from you the thing I need from you, which only you can do. When's the last time you so believed something to be the will of God? You so knew you needed that you said, God, I'm gonna pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. God, I've gotta have it until you finally received it. This is what he's saying. Keep on asking and watch, it'll be given to you. Keep on seeking. God, I'm seeking it until I see it. I need it. You know that I need it. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep asking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and it will be open to you. For everyone, it doesn't say for Pastor John, It doesn't say for clergy. It doesn't say for saintly, godly, perfect people. It says for everyone. And that means everyone who asks receives. If I weren't a Christian, that one verse would be enough to make me want to be a Christian. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who asks, they keep on asking, keep on asking, keep on asking. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. Prayer has this aggressiveness to it that says I'm going to go and go and go and go and go. Maybe the reason why you did not receive, and I don't say this with any sense of condemnation or condescension, I simply say it as suggestion for your consideration. Maybe the reason you didn't receive is you stopped asking. The fact you didn't get it had nothing to do with God's will or his inability. It had to do with you didn't keep asking. So prayer, powerful prayer, aggressively seeks a response from God. Philip Brooks put this, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of his willingness. It's not that, it's not that God is reluctant. Banish that thought. Is a father reluctant to help a child? Never. If you're assigning reluctance to God, then what has happened is you've thought of God as something other than a father. Maybe an employer who says you don't get the raise this time, or the genie who says it's not your turn for three wishes, or the computer I said it once, where is it? And God's just simply wanting you to be reminded He's a father and you're a child. And that is the basis, that is the parameter, that is the descriptor of our relationship with him. Let me close with this. Powerful prayer knows that God will do what is best. Powerful prayer knows, hey, listen, a father, when you have a good father, a little kid trusts their father. They trust their father to do what's best. And let me add this in here before we look at the verse. There are some here today and you're saying, you know, the the problem is, John, I'm just not that, you know, I'm trying to be a good Christian, but honestly, I'm not. And I can see how maybe that's going to work for Dustin or maybe that's how that's going to work for Justin or Brandon. Or I can see that working in other people's life. I just don't see it working in my life because honestly, you know, I'm I'm not what I want to be and what I'm trying to be and... Listen to this. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Fathers do good things. That's just true, isn't it? I mean, I watch my grandkids at Christmas when they're opening presents. They weren't like, I don't know what's in there, you know. I don't know, is there gonna be a boa constrictor? I mean, they're not, they're not thinking that. They can't wait. Why? 
because they know their mom and dad are givers of good gifts, yeah. safe gifts. Now watch this. If you then who are evil, there's some of you in, and you know, who's he talking about? He's talking to the disciples. God recognizes our frailty. Some of you have the wrong view of prayer that somehow you have to be perfect before you can pray and receive from God. And so you don't pray and the devil loves it. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give? I mean, I try to be a good dad to my kids. There's no way I'd be a better dad than God. How much more? Watch this. Will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There's a lot we could say on that, but I'm gonna just say this about it. That is a sign of his incredible generosity. You say, what do you mean? You asked for help and he gave you the helper. You asked for the gift, and he gave you the giver. You asked for a loan, and he gave you the bank. That's the gracious goodness of our God. And that's why you just frankly need to go to him as your loving heavenly father who wants to do more in your life than you could begin to imagine and will if you'll ask. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you.